Thank you everybody for coming. I wanted to start often with the conclusion in mind, which is in my experience, having incorporated the SDGs in my post-university transition course, essentially it's a capstone course. It for me provided a powerful framework to help individuals consider their purpose, which I really think it's a grounding for their career aspiration. So um, think of it as kind of a, a funnel, if you will, where on top you start with the, the bigger version of um, vision of their world. So what is the world that uh, that students want to live in? And then in the middle there, a little bit um, narrower, um, what are the problems and opportunities that students see? They, they believe they need to tackle to realize that particular vision. And then finally, at the end, narrowing down and what they are going to do about it, they as individuals. So thinking about their talents, their experience that can help address these problems and in turn improve the condition of our world. So um, essentially, the SDGs, um, having taught the course and incorporated the SDGs for the last two semesters, it helps students uh, articulate their big, hairy, audacious goal. Um, it's a way for them to declare their challenge and consider how they can dedicate um, their lifelong career goals. So we're thinking beyond, beyond 2030 as well, um, to think about the SDGs that they have chosen to dedicate their career towards. So um, the career development practitioner in me thinks that it's it's actually quite an effective career intervention that continues to impact students um, because even alone just this week as I'm connecting with um, graduates um, that are leaving KPU they tell me um, they've incorporated the SDGs as part of their their mission um, letter of intent for for graduate school possibilities and some even talk about it in their job interviews so I'll spend the rest of the time now telling you how um, um, the idea, how, how I came up with the idea to incorporate the SDGs and what were some of the main interventions. So it all started last summer when um, at KPU, we started the UN SDG Open Pedagogy Fellowship. And later on, I'll follow up with a link in the chat box so you can learn more. And the goal of that fellowship is to incorporate SDGs in my courses by designing what we call renewable assignments. So renewable assignments, um, also called non-disposable assignments, are those that add value to a student's world and they continue to think about these assignments beyond the course as opposed to disposable assignments in which only likely the student and the instructor will see and the student will throw it away after the course. So we want students to continue to have, to generate practical use for these assignments. So. As part of the fellowship, when I started to design the assignments, I quickly came to the realization that for my career development, career transition course to be truly effective and to be of service to students, the SDGs really needed to be incorporated, um, fully integrated throughout the course at the various learning outcomes and at multiple touch points instead of just being a, a simple standalone assignment. So uh, three interventions I'll quickly talk about is um, I introduced the SDGs in the beginning of the course and students were asked to consider what are your current career aspirations and along with that if they can identify one or two SDGs that they believe would be relevant uh, to that aspiration. So I also use it, use the SDGs once they've identified it, uh, I use it as a way to break out uh, into student discussion groups. So they, they often cluster themselves according to their faculty and their programs. And because this is a interdisciplinary course, I wanted to mix them up. So the SDGs was a great way to group them in multiple clusters. So just to give you an example, um, last semester I had students from business, um, from arts and from science who were interested in the uh, zero hunger SDG cluster and as we know when you think about the wicked problems in our world comp complicated problems require multi and interdisciplinary approach to generate solutions so that's a really nice way to incorporate the SDGs um, we also had students in develop their mission statement as part of their e-portfolio project so they were asked what's the work that they want to pursue who are they doing this for and how are people transformed as a result of what they do? So as part of the last question, again, they're infusing the SDGs and talk about the big arching goals and connect it back to their ideal work and profession. 
The last assignment I'll tell you about is um, an information interview project where students were asked to talk with three individuals who they believe can provide insights to their career possibilities. And they were asked to reflect on, the, on these conversations as part of their project. So one of the reflective questions that, were, that was embedded ask them con to consider thinking about the common themes that emerge in these conversations. And again, how did they believe um, these themes and the individuals that they chatted with had further insights into their SDGs? So just to summarize some last minute advice uh, for faculty members and programs who are thinking about integrating the SDGs in the cur curriculum, um, I would say start small and wherever it makes sense. I started by reviewing my course and program objectives looking at, okay, this could be um, natural connections and I can design um, activities that are infused with SDGs. And then secondly, consider if there were particular SDGs that made more sense to incorporate based on the nature of your course. So for me, um, I gave students the, the agency to choose because they're all coming in from variety of discipline. And so they got to choose as opposed to me saying, we're gonna work on a particular SDG this semester. And then finally, um, evaluation is important. So formal evaluation, of course, through um, teaching and course evaluations, and then informally, um, I poll the students throughout the semester. So I asked, I shared with them um, this activity, I was hoping to accomplish this particular objective, that they think incorporate the SDGs were helpful in fulfilling the objective. And what would they do if um, they were me, the educator? So um, that's it for me, happy to stay connected and I'll just share my um, contact information in the chat box. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Candy. Um, that, that was uh, a great start uh, to our discussion and I particularly like the renewable assignment uh, piece that uh, right away stuck with me and I will certainly consider that. Um, and now we're moving on uh, to uh, Carolyn, uh, Carolyn and uh, she will share with us uh, a new social innovation uh, practice and I'm very curious to hear your more about that. Thank you for your introdu introduction, Catherine. Uh, as well, Candy, thank you for your, your presentation. I uh, really interesting uh, program that you've developed and with a lot of resident resonance with uh, some of the goals that we have at the CIRAD, which I'm, I'd love to talk to you about. Um, so as Catherine mentioned, I'm gonna talk about this idea of embracing social innovation practices and what this approach can bring to the development of sustainability curricula and how to build back better through these higher ed approaches. Um, so let me begin briefly with my organization, which is the CIRAD. We are a strategic research alliance bringing together scientists and social scientists across the region of Quebec who are working broadly in the sphere of sustainability. And we are funded by the Fonds de Recherche de Québec. Our mandate is to accelerate the transformation of Quebec society towards sustainability in order to support the socio-environmental transition. And we do that through a, a, an interdisciplinary and a transdisciplinary approach, as well as sustainable innovation pathways. So we are not actually a university, but we're rather a network of research and university actors. Um, and we are currently involved in an Education for Sustainability project where our role is to mobilize the main players, including universities, in order to co-create innovative education programming that is geared to enhancing uh, SDG capacity building at the city scale. Um, clearly, universities have a critical role to play in, in education for sustainability and in addressing the uh, 2030 agenda towards a more sustainable and just and, and resilient world, particularly in the post-COVID era. Um, at the, at the CIRAD, we have adopted a social innovation approach and process that is geared to fostering connections between universities uh, and other players that are connected with real life education needs and issues on the ground. Um, so it's really in this context that the CIRAD has created partnerships with several local players here in Montreal and Quebec including the Maison de l'Innovation Sociale, which is a not-for-profit organization and a critical player in Quebec's social innovation ecosystem, 
as well as Concordia University and other collaborators. And we've, uh, we're coming together to develop and pilot an international summer school in societal transformation to be held in Montreal in 2021. Uh, Candy was looking uh, at the results of a, of a program that was recently uh, launched. We're really looking to the future uh, and in the planning stages of something that we will be piloting uh, in uh, next summer. The goal of the summer school is to pilot the development of a program that is geared to the training of individuals who really aspire to be agents of change and agents of transformation with a focus on the skills and competencies that they need in order to address uh, complex problem solving. So there are a couple of uh, aspects of this approach that I, I wanted to highlight. And the first relates to course content, and the second relates to process. So in terms of course content, we are drawing on state-of-the-art education and pedagogical approaches uh, that are well recognized both in the literature and in practice. For example, the core competencies for sustainability model, which of course is adopted by UNESCO. Um, as well as uh, global citizenship for education, uh, and human flourishing approaches and others. So in terms of content, the program aims to integrate a broad portfolio of, of knowledge and, and skills and values um, that will enable learners in several areas. And these include um, the development of uh, character qualities like leadership and social and moral purpose as well as the development of concrete skills to, for example, anticipate future problems or to embrace and manage complexity and uncertainty. Um, another example is, is ways to generate uh, innovative and systemic strategies that are based on collaboration between different kinds of stakeholders at different scales. And of course, this theme of collaboration is one that um, we've heard in the past couple of days quite uh, regularly. When it comes to process, um, the second dimension that I wanted to highlight is that we are taking a social innovation approach that will make it possible to co-create the pedagogy and the curriculum with different stakeholders. So the idea here is to integrate not only the knowledge of our partners and sustainability experts, but also to design the course with those that are impacted by sustainability issues so, so that it is of direct, excuse me, <laughs> Simon. Um, benefit to, to them. Sorry about that. Um, so this involves the participation of, uh, in the case of our project, the summer school, the participation of municipal actors like the City of Montreal, uh, as well as we're exploring uh, opportunities with, within the industry, with in, excuse me, with industry leaders, um, as well as impacted communities and the learners themselves, such as students like Beth, uh, who is on this panel, and the SDSN Youth Network. So in terms of building back better through education for sustainability approaches, um, I, I think that the COVID pandemic is really shining a very bright light on uh, already existing inequalities that we see in our cities. Uh, as certain communities and populations are disproportionately impacted by the COVID crisis. Um, in Montreal, this, the elderly immediately come to mind, uh, as well as certain low income and racialized communities, uh, indigenous communities, and others. Uh, the situation in Montreal North, for example, we have the largest concentration of cases in the city in a very densely populated area. Um, low income uh, and primarily largely immigrant community. So um, the situation, the COVID uh, impact is very, very serious in this area. It's one of the poorest districts in Montreal with more than 20% poverty rate with people living in, in very tight living spaces. Um, so there are a lot of different characteristics. Uh, for example, 
several, many of the women residents of Haitian background are working in elderly care and in the CHSLDs, which is contributing to the spread of the virus. So one of the ways that we can build back better from this crisis is to explore how we can link in with communities, for example, uh, in Montreal North, uh, in the program development process in order to uh, understand the impacts of this crisis on the ground and to explore opportunities to work with community actors in the development of educational programming that is grounded in the reality of local impact um, and to address local need through the co-development of experiential learning and case-based approaches. So there's an, a, an important, I just wanna um, finish by saying that there's an important community development aspect to the CIROD Summer School in order to build those linkages in impacted communities and to integrate this knowledge in the curriculum development process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Um, this is a very uh, interesting um, approach to build um, the, uh, the curriculum content and everything in a participatory way. And I'm uh, very curious when you will have your first uh, findings from the first round in 2021 to learn more about that. Um, I would like to move on uh, and uh, uh, learn more about appropriate youth uh, involvement, um, a problem that we are, I, I believe many organizations on all levels are struggling with. And I'd like to um, invite Beth now to give, um, to share some of her insight. Thank you so much, Catherine. And I just wanted to say uh, it's wonderful to be here among many other wonderful women who are, you know, having to do this alongside families and whatnot. You guys are incredibly inspiring to me and I always try to voice that whenever I do some type of presentation that women empowerment is super important. So I'm super proud to be on a panel with you guys. Um, I like to shake things up and I wanna go and kind of focus on this one thing that is what is sustainable development and that definition of sustainable development. Let's go back to that um, because the true definition of sustainable development is meeting the needs of the current generation without compromising the needs of future generations to meet their own needs. So within that, intergenerational equity is fundamental. We must have youth participation in decision making and integrating the SDGs. And that is why I'm here. And I think you should, everybody should be listening to youth and institutions. I will tell you a bit more about how to do that. So we as SDSN Canada, we mobilize colleges and institutions um, and universities across Canada as a network um, to progress the SDGs. And we did a consultation with youth in 2019. Um, we asked youth around Canada if they felt confident that achieving the SDGs would lead to a better future uh, for their generation. And it was really interesting to see that 90% of those youth members found that the SDGs would be important for them. And, you know, they wanted to implement the SDGs. So there's a really big need there. Um, Within that, the SDG that was like the most pressing for them and had um, significance in terms of their own lives was SDG uh, 13, Climate Actions. That came out absolutely top. And that is also an SDG that I focus on personally. I think it's a really big one and connects all of the other SDGs. And so we need to put SDG 13, Climate Action, at the forefront of our plans. Um, within that, we also saw that second to that was quality education, SDG 4, and reducing inequalities, SDG 10. So obviously, we're all working in quality education. Um, if you look at the indicators from SDSN particularly, um, in 2019, they showed through our SDG index in Canada that we're progressing, uh, we're pretty good for progressing SDG 4. But SDG 13 um, was needing some, some, some work. So maybe how can we mobilize youth to help implement that at our institutions is a good question to ask. So what do I do and what's the program that I run in Canada? Um, the program is called the SDG Students Program and it's from SDSN Youth. Um, I'm the national representative for um, youth in Canada for that. And we're implementing this program across our network institutions. 
the SD program is an initiative from SDSN Youth, which is an initiative of SDSN Global, and it aims to engage students at higher education to implement the SDGs through empowering them, equipping them with skills, and finding pathways to have that action. And I always try to tell people as well that, you know, there's a kind of a theory of change with that. How do we start to make change with the SDGs in use? Well, it begins with teaching them and learning about the SDGs. And we can see that that's, that's happening and we're pushing that forward. And then engaging them, engaging them in the decision-making processes or on their campuses, and then actually getting them to act on the SDGs. Um, and so we are able to do that with our SDG hubs or alliances across Canada. So I help mentor and coach SDG campus coordinators across Canada who are in our institutions. And um, they are part of a global network of student hubs around the world, which are aiming to come together to learn about, engage and tackle the SDGs in their institutions. And um, I saw a key word was coming up when we were all talking which was really amazing because it's something that is always something on the top of my list to try to push forward is collaboration so when we look at what youth are already doing we realize actually you know you know quite a lot and they're very passionate and the reason they go to university could be that they want to progress an issue and so they start clubs or they get involved with services or they decide to do research and a big question is, how can we get them to match their work to the SDGs? Well, that kind of helped, um, that question was in my mind at the end of 2018, and we started to build an alliance at the University of Waterloo, where I study, called the Impact Alliance. And the Impact Alliance worked with student clubs, services, and faculty to match all of their processes to the SDGs. And we did that through a really fun way. We created a campus-wide week-long scavenger hunt which matched all of the student clubs and activities and initiatives already existing on campus to the SDGs. So um, we realized there was so much already being done and um, I encourage you to, to look at that because we need to integrate sustainability and SDGs with a holistic view and be interdisciplinary. So what is already going on and how can we already match the great work that students are doing to progress the uh, 2030 agenda? Thank you so much for letting me share. Thank you very much. Um, I, I certainly uh, will approach you after the session to learn more from uh, more from you because that is definitely also something that uh, we're struggling in our work um, for the IAU cluster. And uh, I'd like to um, give a brief overview on the work that I'm doing, which is uh, the coordination for SDG4 in the IAU cluster on higher education and research for sustainable development. And uh, Beth, I'm super happy that you brought up the um, original um, uh, definition on, on sustainable development from um, 1987. Uh, we, we still use, um, use this one and it's, uh, it's really great that it's being picked up by the next um, generation in the same way. The IAU um, cluster, IAU stands for International Association of Universities, an organization associated um, with UNESCO, and they launched the cluster on higher education and um, research for sustainable development in, in a way that they assigned each of the SDGs to a particular university to work together with partners from other world regions. And um, in this global cluster, two of the 17 SDGs are coordinated out of Canada. One SDG 4 at York University on quality education and the um, uh, University of Regina is responsible for the coordination of the SDG 12 um, uh, on responsible consumption and production. So what does this all mean? Our overall goal in the cluster is to develop concrete responses that help achieving the SDGs and um, first of all assisting the higher education community worldwide to have 
some kind of unified voice in the discussion. In the SDGs, it was the first time that um, higher education was mentioned this broadly and uh, with the SDG for a target um, uh, in target for three, um, in requiring the access, um, higher education is getting a very strong role in the, in the international discussion. And what we're trying to do is to unify this voice. On the other hand, uh, the cluster is um, supposed to support individual institutions with ideas and materials to achieve their particular goal set within the SDGs. The cluster follows um, an, a holistic approach, embedding sustainability throughout all aspects of the institution, and even intending in, in the idea of the unified voice to look into a whole system approach. SDG 4 in particular, we are following um, uh, ESD, Education for Sustainable Development, as a vital aspect of quality education. And what does this mean for students? We're, we're hoping that students that are able uh, to, to receive an education where sustainable development is embedded, we're hoping that they will understand the importance of sustainability in all of their decision making. And some of them even taking up sustainable development as a commitment as being change agents for them. If we consider that even today, um, roughly 40% enrollment in um, higher education, but only very few people overall globally go to university, um, they will be, although they're a very small number, they will be the vast majority of decision makers, societal influencers, and uh, we really need this leading, leading voice to be committed to sustainable development. Um, we've developed SDG oriented um, or SDG inspired action on the university level with materials and uh, toolkits. And we also look into the SDGs as a potential driver of transformation. As the interconnectedness of the SDGs that we see, all of these um, SDGs, especially during the pandemic now, are absolutely interconnected. Um, so this is the chance for us to walk away from the disciplines and academic silos that we've been thinking in. Within the SDG um, 12 cluster, um, coordinated by the University of uh, Regina, um, they particularly look at encouraging students to, uh, to gain a greater awareness um, in their decision making for their livelihoods and lifestyles and how the consumption um, and their, their own consumption plays a role in that and how their decision making in one country, in one region of the world might have consequences for others. And uh, we're hoping that those ideas can be brought into the community and in the workplace, especially if we're looking at the trades, at the vocations and small and medium sized enterprises. They need to be geared towards sustainability, pick up sustainability issues um, and um, secure, and not only to serve the community, but also to secure their long-term business survival. This is just a very, very brief um, idea on the IAU cluster. I encourage you um, to look up the overall, um, uh, overall defin uh, definitions and uh, descriptions on the internet. I will share the link um, right after. And just in, in general, and to set the tone for the, for the next um, uh, question period, we have 10 years until 2030. We have a pandemic, we have a climate urgency, we have huge inequalities in the world using and steering change through higher education is, is our responsibility. This is really what we have to do. It's not just an option. Sustainability is not just an add-on. It is the purpose. It is a purpose of what we're doing and why we're educating people. And we hope that this um, IAU cluster will contribute to that. Thank you very much. I would uh, like to, um, from the global scale now, we had an example on career education. We talked about a, a summer school element, youth involvement overall. I would like to move on to um, a few questions that I've um, noted during, um, during the session. And um, I'm wondering, um, let me start with Candy again. So we start um, at the beginning again. How do you think can the link between um, the SDGs and career education help students and recent graduates when we return to a new normal, when we build back better and build back better, when we return into the workplace and into our world again? 
long answer short so much there's so <laughs> much possibilities that are out there um i'm conducting a research project right now on the class of 2020 and their kind of unique career transition um conundrum that they found themselves so i'm following articles and thought leaders on the topic with a lot of interest i would say that overall career development career management um, approach for students and recent graduates, it shouldn't change. You should still be doing um, things like de developing self-awareness, knowing your strengths and talent, and how you'll use them in your career aspiration. But I do think, though, um, more than ever, there's a huge potential for students and grads to use the SDGs as part of their career strategy. So um, the pandemic itself has made the SDGs much more pronounced um, and apparent in our society. So if students and grads can talk about their strengths and talents and talk about their aspiration and their intention to leverage to help um, address the SDGs, they can, I, I believe, much more effectively demonstrate their ability and desire to contribute not only to future organization and become an asset, but think about the larger community and the greater good and what, what's, their, um, what's their piece of their pie? What's their responsibility? Interesting. And um, I mean, now graduates don't only um, have the challenge that they're returning to a new world, but they also might, to ha might have to change all of their plans and, and, you know, create a new vision for themselves. How do you think um, a course like, like yours, where the SDGs are integrated, can be of benefit for them? Mm -hmm. For sure. I think, um, I think the beauty of the SDGs and using it as a career development strategy is that students start by um, going back to the funnel again, the overarching goal um, of what they want to work towards. And then they, they look at, okay, what occupations, what professional roles can I, um, do I find myself in to fulfill these goals? So in, in the era of COVID-19, in this new normal, um, I think the SDG framework actually Actually encourage um, encourage students to remain flexible and open to multiple career possibilities that align with the goals that they want to work on. Um, and I would add, um, nerd out a little bit, um, the model um, offers an alternative to more of the traditional career model where people look for work and then their profession might address a global issue. So we're kind of disruptive and turning it around, having students work backwards. And I, and, and I actually think it's wonderfully disruptive and, and useful. In, in the age that we're at right now. And then I also just realized in the chat box, I've only been commenting to the panelists. So I'll also leave my contact information to all attendees. Um, feel free to stay in touch. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, students are one, one stakeholder group in, um, in the education community, but moving uh, beyond that, and I would like to uh, move on uh, to Beth, and I'm wondering what additional benefits will um, a stakeholder approach to um, bring to curricula and pedagogy to shift towards a more sustainable future, especially in the current situation, like during and after the pandemic? I, I think that's I think that's actually something that would be oriented to me, Catherine. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm at, I'm at, <laughs> sure. Yeah, at the summer school aspect of uh, um, together developing um, a curriculum and the pedagogy. Yeah, sorry. Sure. So yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. I think that vulnerable communities that have been deeply impacted by sustainability challenges, be they environmental or economic or social, and also those that have been impacted by this current crisis. These are the very communities that often face education challenges, right? I think that these are often marginalized communities that experience, for example, low graduation rates or, um, uh, you know, negative education experience that is caused by a disconnection between educational programming that's offered and the learning needs of the people in, in communities. So by building linkages with community stakeholders and designing the course with them, uh, which is what we're trying to achieve with the summer school, the hope is really to bridge that gap 
so that the course will be of benefit to community constituents and stakeholders. So in this way, um, it could help them to build back, build back better um, in, by creating community-based systemic pathways towards resilience and regeneration and change that are socially beneficial. Right. So that's one example. I think this idea could also be, be applied to the business community. Um, so by bringing in industry stakeholders in our uh, program development process, we can better understand the direct impacts of the crisis on companies and the business ecosystem. And we can develop case-based pedagogies that seek to address these, some of these real life issues. So the, the main idea here is that the co-creation of educational programming with stakeholders allows for the integration of real life challenges and pragmatic interventions into program development. And uh, just a follow up question for communication, because um, the communication to develop ideas uh, together now has really changed through the through the pandemic. How does this affect your current planning for 2021? Communication in terms of the need to developing, uh, yeah, and just and uh, just to understand the the current uh, state of the project is um, uh, is the curriculum finally developed already, or are you still working on that? We're 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 quite in the early stages, so we're putting the funding mechanisms and the the models in place and building the partnerships at this time and moving towards very very quickly the pedagogy co-creation and development process and putting advisory uh, board and governance structures in place. And everything online now, I would assume. Is this all done uh, through online meetings or how do, you, how do you cope with the communication with the different stakeholders? Oh, right. So clearly um, we've had to innovate in terms of communication and shift to virtual forms of uh, virtual platforms. And I think this is, there's a call for us all to innovate in this space and how do we create these kinds of uh, experiences that are increasingly needing to be virtual. And um, so absolutely, we, we are currently doing that in a virtual, <laughs> in virtual formats. And even if you're just at the early stages of this, how could you imagine scaling up such a stakeholder influenced um, program and such a summer school? How could you imagine that? That would be interesting for us to learn for such a global cluster. Sure. So the question of scaling is, is an important one. Uh, the, the goal is to capture the strategic outcomes and the learnings of the pilot project that we uh, will test in 2021 and as well its evaluation. So we would like to explore opportunities for scaling up for greater impact and within a longer and more specialized curriculum uh, through different, different levels. And so we would obviously begin with our core partners. What are the opportunities uh, within the CIRAD member universities? Uh, with our partner, the Maison de l'Innovation Sociale, in their existing programs, such as this, their Civic Incubator Program. Um, as well, what are the opportunities within our uh, partnerships at Concordia University to scale into something that is perhaps four or eight months long? Um, mm -hmm. What are the opportunities to scale locally and provincially through, for example, the City of Montreal? Uh, initiatives that are in place, as well as continuing edu education projects throughout Quebec. Uh, and finally, I think there are really interesting opportunities to explore scaling through, through national networks. So the Federation of Canadian Municipalities is one, and of course our very own SDSN network is, is another important uh, mm -hmm. uh, network. So the goal, I think, is to export this model to other contexts and jurisdictions. But of course, there are aspects of what we're trying to do that are very locally embedded. When we think about building stakeholder and community-based relations in, in communities and in places, this is not something we can stay at scale, but certainly our approach and our process is something that we, we are exploring uh, in terms of scaling. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, I, again, open up the, the youth question in that, and uh, now I'm moving uh, on to you, Beth. 
and I'm asking for advice. Um, what, what do you feel should uh, university and college leaders in Canada do to successfully and engage young people, not only as um, from time to time or for specific projects, but really into their strategic planning and especially when it comes to sustainability planning or even a whole institution approach? Thank you so much. I think that's a really important question. And I actually have a pretty simple answer for it. Um, it's inviting youth to the table. I think in institutions, we often think that youth don't want to be a part of the decision making or it's boring having meetings with different members on campus. But really, youth are there because they care about an issue and they're experiencing it at the, the forefront of their lives. And some of those issues obviously can be related to paying for their education or the different culture or religion they're from and the different um, maybe discrimination they're getting or whatnot. So it's important to have youth, pe youth members at the table at decision making. Um, I know from my experience, I have tried to sit on a million different advisory boards to get experience in terms of career as well, right? Because you can sit on a board and you're like, oh, that's how that works, you know? Like I know how the city works, I know how education works. And we have to provide those opportunities for youth. Like it's, don't be scared to provide that opportunity. You know, like it's a really great um, time for them as a youth member to learn, but also for you to learn from them too. And uh, youth are at your doorstep if you're in higher education, they're there. And I would really utilize them in uh, different decision-making processes by different forms of participation. And for those who are listening, um, listening into the session, um, what would you recommend uh, to those who are interested in starting an SDSN hub at their university? Um, well, I should tell, I will say do it because it's great. Um, <laughs> um, I've seen a lot of like engagement in the chat about this. Um, I, the first thing that you can do in uh, terms of like admin wise, you, your institution needs to be a member of SDSN Canada in your host country. So in Canada, uh, in Canada, it's SDSN Canada. So you need to become a member. You can do that on our page. And then after that, your institution can sign up to recruit an SDG campus coordinator. The SDG campus coordinator would then be trained by SDSN youth. You get official UN training and it's super uh, intense at times, but I think you will learn a lot from it. And then you will help uh, be mentored and helped uh, and be part of a global platform to um, help uh, you implement the SDGs on your campus through the SDG Students Programme and with the national coordinator, who is myself in Canada for now. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like the first step. But I would really also say if you can't do that right now, I'm actually hosting a workshop tomorrow on, on this about SDG leaders on campuses. The workshop will be recorded. We're going to be writing um, a white paper on it and there will be resources available. We need to make resources free and available for all. So I realized the importance of that. So you can get a hold of those. And I would also say to any youth member listening right now and they don't know how to get involved or they're scared, I would say, honestly, have the confidence to just step out. Um, and, and do it like you're passionate about an issue and that normally relates to an SDG and higher education and like institutions do want to hear from you and I think within that anyone who's in higher education listening right now I think it's important that you are able to mentor and coach young people because there's often a fear that stepping up for an issue would have negative effects um, on them and that they don't know how and when to do that but the first step is just you know, um, trying. <laughs> so yeah, have the confidence to do so. And, and please reach out to me. Like I'm always coaching different youth people and really interested in engagement activities. So I'll leave my email. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, just a personal question. Um, how, do you, um, how do you encourage those that say, I am so overwhelmed with my program. I'm already studying. I'm already doing so many things. Um, how do you deal with, with those kinds of worries by, uh, by students uh, not wanting to be engaged but not feeling um, strong enough to do it? I have heard this millions of times and I am again like have had those issues so I can completely understand. One of the things that I mentioned previously in the activities that I ran or with an amazing group of students at the University of Waterloo in 2019 was 
we matched everything we were already doing with the SDGs. So if you want to start advocacy work for an SDG or an area and you're swamped with schoolwork, why don't you match one of your projects or why don't you post your essay or your op-ed and show the world what you've been doing because higher education isn't just theory and learning in a classroom. It's so much more and we should be encouraging people to apply what they're learning to the greater world. So um, I would say look at what you're already doing and advocate for it and push it forward and approach your professor and say, you know what, my essay was really good. I want to do research in this or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think matching your, your already existing activities is, is like a really big one. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and um, just if we um, uh, think, think further, we have uh, the student level and I would like to open up uh, the question uh, to all of the panelists. Um, what are, what are your recommendations? And this is a, um, a question from the audience um, to keep the momentum going from the student level to the graduate level, maybe Candy working in career education. How do you keep the momentum um, going for all of your students? Um, in career development, we, we started a, a movement called uh, Career Ninjas. So I think transferring into this context, uh, students, faculty, and, and staff and administrators have the potential to each be um, SDG ninjas, if you will. And I really, Beth, when, when you were saying that your, your spiel so, so passionately, I, I can't help but raise my hands to you um, because it, any little thing that you do matters. And from a professor standpoint, I would never turn down a passionate student who wants to write something that they really care about. I'm like, go, go, go. And, and if it's something you're passionate about, it's contagious and, and people want to learn more about it. And the, the, the plus for the student is you get a higher mark for writing something you care about because you research it, you care about it, you're going to do better. So everybody can do their part, ultimately. And uh, maybe I can extend that question also to uh, um, the community level um, for those uh, I'm reaching out to, uh, to Carolyn. Um, how do you um, keep the momentum going for those who have participated in helping you develop a, um, a proper curriculum in your community? How do you keep their engagement going beyond that project? So, you know, what comes to mind in terms of momentum is really um, the, the sense of urgency that we're all facing in addressing the current crisis and sustainability challenges more broadly and doing that by working with communities and developing educational programs that, that are really rooted in, in, in real life challenges and needs. So I think uh, that's something in and of itself that the sense of urgency is something that is keeping us all trying to push this process forward. Mm -hmm. And uh, another question from the audience, um, how do you get involved with the different stakeholders to participate in your program? So we get involved with different stakeholders through uh, the relationships that we have in place and through our partnerships. Um, so um, we, we and as, as well as, as a process of community engagement, so reaching out and building those relationships with the community. So it, it kind of starts with uh, the, the already existing partnerships that we have in place and using our networks with our, par with our partners around the table on the project and building out from there. So um, it's, it's a process that is based on, on building linkages with communities and building a sense of trust in order to create something together moving forward. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm, I'm opening up uh, the next uh, question that came out from the from the audience as well. Um, what are your general um, suggestions and recommendations for uh, um, higher education to integrate the SDGs at a more institutional level? We have the example of a, of a summer school, how can, or the example of career education, um, how can this move beyond um, the particular project and into an institutional dimension? I have um, a quick thing about that, actually. Um, as I said previously, a way to 
progress at SDGs and what we've talked about, I think, in the localizing session as well, is matching your strategic plans for the SDGs. So I've worked with different like cities or universities on this. And um, if you're matching your goals towards SDGs, you can progress them. And so within that, you might find that there's some gaps that you need to fill either with research or um, different areas that you can progress in terms of maybe like climate action or having um, access to more resources for students. I can't think of anything on the spot right now. But honestly, I would say matching your strategic plan to the SDGs is a really big one. And you've got to keep in mind that the SDGs is a global framework and it's a common framework. So it could be understood by multiple universities across the world. So if you're doing something that's um, even more power to you if you're technically progressing global issues in your own institution. Yeah, that is actually um, playing right into uh, into our work as a global cluster, always involving all different um, UN world regions to not only develop an approach in one region that works, but also see what can be used and what is possible um, to be brought to another region to really create an equal learning experience together. Yeah. What are the recommendations from uh, the others? Would you like to uh, add anything, uh, Candy or Carolyn? to bring um, the SDGs to a more institutional level from your project idea? So I think just to resonate um, some of the ideas that we had in scaling up our, our, our pilot project and exploring opportunities to develop something that is a more in-depth and more long-term long on social societal transformation is really uh, to integrate it as a, as a course in its own right in a university is, is certainly uh, one option. Mm -hmm. And Candy? I um, share the link to the Open Pedagogy UN SDG Fellowship, and I, I would say that that's a pretty pivotal ninja move in the institution that I work with, work at. And most recently, um, I understand that our, our research office um, is actually aligning all of our research proposals um, and asking uh, research applicants to identify what it, what is and what are the SDGs that your research is going to contribute towards. So uh, I, I think those are two winning moves, but they're a good start. Um, there's more work to be done at the curriculum and program level that I think faculty members, department heads are working towards. So mm -hmm. it has to be uh, both ground up and top down. Thank you. And uh, the first question that we ever received uh, today in the chat was, uh, how do you work the S uh, with the SDG about poverty? Um, any comments on that? In particular, SDG when in poverty. Would anybody like to comment on that one? Because it was our first question. I want to put a challenging point out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, food for thought, I guess. Um, I think we as institutions actually need to look at SDG one with a quite a critical lens in terms of let's think about the international students that are coming or the type of students that only just made it into um, higher education and supporting them and providing tools. And that might be in the form of food banks or housing, but I think we need to look quite critically to this point. Um, some institutions feel like maybe it's not their responsibility to progress and help um, alleviate poverty in the operations, but I truly believe it, it is one of the most important things. And if we wanna link it to an economic lens, you know, students are paying thousands of dollars to go to university um, and it's straining on them and we don't want it to have an effect on their own mental health or physical health. So I don't know what the answer is, but I know that this is something that we should definitely look at a bit more critically. Mm -hmm. Did anybody um, else comment, like to comment on that? Okay. As we're approaching uh, the end of the session, I'd like to uh, invite you um, to, um, if I haven't picked up a question that you really like to answer or to give your last uh, recommendations that you haven't been able to share, or the questions that haven't been, haven't, haven't, uh, we haven't covered yet, I'd like to invite you to give kind of a closing statement. And I suggest that we go in, in the order as we did the presentation. So I invite uh, Candy to start with a closing statement and include those questions that you'd like to, like to um, respond to. 
Yeah, I think um, something that really resonated with me in, in this hour that we shared together is um, we need to do a better job of conducting an inventory of what everybody is doing, uh, recognizing that we're all doing great work and sometimes often in multiple levels and in, in silos. So um, I think my final comment is just to, to stay in touch and continue to have this dialogue so we can amplify our, our influence and, and help each other. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Carolyn, do you have any thoughts that you'd like to share? Any recommendations? Sure. So when thinking about applying social innovation pro, uh, processes and approaches to co-developing sustainability uh, programming and curricula, um, I think one of the major obstacles that in moving towards a sustainability in the SDGs in higher ed is that um, we want to, we want to uh, incorporate a participative approach in order to integrate diverse kinds of knowledge and worldviews, but we don't want to overload that process with complexity, right? So we want to be able to create, create something and facilitate a process that, where, that is actionable and whereby we can achieve a consensus. Uh, and that's not very easy to do, um, but it's, uh, I think it's a very, very important goal to have in mind. Mm -hmm. Beth, what would be your final words? <laughs> I think Candy kind of hit it on the head for me um, and Carolyn's points as well really like synergize all that together because I really feel that collaboration is a really big point in terms of higher education we sometimes work in silos and different faculties and have different goals but if we could align them maybe that's in strategic planning maybe that's through youth in different faculties uh, I think that could be a re really important point to help to achieve the SDGs and um, so I encourage you to collaborate and um, I'm going to be constantly looking at new ways to get youth involved um, but yeah, if to any youth, I've got a lot of questions about this. If you did want to get involved, you can look up SDSN Youth. There's lots of volunteer opportunities on that. And I encourage you to look at um, different volunteer opportunities that you can get involved with on campus or in your personal life, um, because I think you always should be an advocate for something. So um, those two points. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. And I will definitely take you up on the on the offer and uh, get your advice how to involve more youth in our SDG4 cluster. Thank you. Thank you very much um, to all of you. This was a pleasure. I learned a lot for our cluster to take away from. And um, as a final, uh, final aspect, I'd just like to remind everyone that the original idea of um, enough for all forever of education for sustainable development was never um, intended to be only um, applicable to humans, but we want to consider all life on planet and uh, we really want to ex extend um, the idea and uh, yeah, thank you for listening in. Thank you for following the session um, and I wish you well for the afternoon. Stay safe. This has been an amazing experience. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you. Guys. Thank you all.